This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So good, um, good afternoon. Uh, so it's an absolute pleasure for me to, uh, as a NS Executive Director, to introduce Eric Brothers, who is almost like the co, I should say, almost a co-editor of the NS Magazine at the moment, since we have a good uh, flow of very interesting papers from you uh, in the magazine. But prior to being um, a magazine contributor, you authored the book Berlin Ghetto, Herbert Baum and the Anti-Fascist Resistance. And you have been a freelance journalist for over a decade for the High Times magazine in New York. So you research and write about anti-fascist resistance in Nazi Germany and publish widely on numismatics and related topics. Uh, if our statistics are correct, you have authored more than 250 published articles, essays, reviews, and blog posts, um, including articles in the NS Magazine, in the NS Pocket Change, so the blog, and you have been featured in the Society's podcast, The Planchette. Um, now, uh, before we, we move into your presentation on uh, uh, Chinese uh, trade coins, um, it's absolutely by luck because we, we do plan long tables many months in advance, but by calendar, uh, kind of chronological luck, I'd like to acknowledge as well a very substantial donation of uh, trade coins, more than 600 of them, um, which have been a couple of weeks ago donated to the society by NS um, Life Fellow, William Bird. Um, I think William is attending the long table today. And on top of the 600 coins, um, Mr. Bird donated to the society a substantial cash gift in order to allow for the society to hire a curatorial assistant to process with a cataloging of this major donation. So I'd, I'd like to thank you on behalf of our society and, you know, sort of celebrate that we, we, are, we receive a coin that at the same time we're going to benefit from this very interesting um, talk on this long table. So without further ado, I step aside now. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for joining this presentation today. The period I will discuss stretches from when China first began receiving silver Spanish coins to just before the American trade dollar was produced. I would like to present some background on the Chinese monetary system. Copper coins were the basic money during the entire imperial period. Such coins were called cash, and there was a continuity of state policy to control, whether efficient or not, the issuance of cash coins in succeeding dynasties. Economic growth during the medieval economic revolution resulted in expanding beyond solely copper coinage. The demand for new currencies was driven by the private economic sector, not the state or public financial institutions. The earliest Chinese silver currency was the tail system. This was a very complex system. The silver ingots in this system were called yin liang, silver tail, which combined two Chinese characters, yin for silver and liang for tail. Yin refers to the silver fineness, while liang means weight. The ingots were also called sisi, and were crafted in square and oval shapes, as well as shoes, boats, flowers, tortoises, and other forms. Sisi ingots were not produced by the government or mints, but by individual silversmiths around China. This lack of a central control resulted in there being a great diversity of silver fineness and weight of these ingots. In the Qing dynasty, there were four main tail weighting systems. Treasury standard, River Standard, 
Pass standard and Canton standard. However, there were innumerable regional tail systems employed throughout Qing China, far too many to quantify. The Qing Dynasty fixed the official exchange ratio between silver and copper cash as one tail of silver to 1,000 pieces or one string of copper cash. However, because the purity and weight of silver sicey ingots had so many varieties similar to the purity and weight of copper cash, this, this exchange rate was always negotiated before concluding a monetary transaction. This is quite different from the gold to silver by metallism ratios in the US and the European nations, which never had flexibility in their ratios. Spanish dollars were brought to China on ships of the British East India Company, EIC, during the late 17th century and early 18th century, supercargoes on East India Company ships were ordered to have specie valued as 90% of their cargo destined for China. It was both Spanish coins from Spain and Spanish America that were brought to the Celestial Empire. These coins included cobs, which were produced from the early 1500s until the mid 18th century, and the Spanish mill dollar, which was first produced in Mexico in 1732. When the Spanish mill dollar was introduced in China in 1732, they were considered to have a touch of 94. A touch meant the degree of fineness of pure silver. In 1772, with the advent of the Corollas dollars, 1772 to 1808, the touch was lowered to 92 to reflect the lowering of the silver content. Other species sent to China in the 17th century included Venetian ducatoons, French crowns, and rix dollars from Scandinavian and German mints. With the notable exception of the Spanish milled and Corollas dollars, the general ratings of the touch were constantly changing. Standards and weights at different mints varied greatly. Assaying methods were at best crude and very inconsistent. Attempts at counterfeiting were common and at times condoned by nations seeking a trade advantage. This affected the Chinese greatly because they had no silver coinage of their own and thus employed the silver specie of other lands for their economic and financial endeavors. John M. Willem, who authored The United States Trade Dollar, America's Only Unwanted, Unhonored Coin, writes, the Chinese merchant who had to pay the ultimate penalty not only had to be concerned by the differences between the coins of several nations offered in payments for his goods, but constantly wary of attempts to counterfeit those in which he placed his greatest trust. The Spanish dollar was the most plentiful, the most uniform, and most clearly marked by year and mint. The Chinese came to view with suspicion all coin except the Spanish, on which they could keep a practiced eye. Demand for the Spanish coin increased as the volume of this China trade expanded, and it was collected from every port in the world for use in the China trade. The above foreshadows how United States silver coins fared in the China trade vis-a-vis -vis the Spanish dollar. Problems with Spanish dollars in China. The Chinese reliance upon the Spanish dollar resulted in a crisis with the outbreak of war between England and Spain in summer 1779. That war lasted until 1783. The war made it virtually impossible to acquire Spanish dollars in quantity in London. East India Company officials in Canton made a proposal to Warren Hastings, Governor General of India. They proposed that the British Mint in Canton a Spanish dollar of the same weight and fineness of the ubiquitous one being sent to China in trade. The East India Company sent dyes and other equipment for production of an imitation Corollas dollar dated 1778, the year before the start of the war. There was a mint constructed near Canton and coinage began. A fraudulent issue, the EIC employed the exact same design and devices of the Spanish coin. 
The EIC did not want to compromise its position in China by producing a debased coin, and to that end, match the weight and fineness of the Spanish dollar. According to the proposal, quote, the dollar ought to be exactly 92 touch or 92 one hundredths part fine silver, end quote. However, as Robert Burns wrote in his 1785 poem, To a Mouse, the best laid schemes of mice and men oft go awry, writes Willem. The East India Company made one important mistake. It entrusted the operation of the Canton Mint to native officials and native labor. Greed for profits led to such debasement that the 1788 coin was soon issued at six parts silver to four parts alloy, 0.600 fine. The defection was quickly spotted by the native assayers, Schroffs, and the coin discounted for its actual weight of pure silver. By its date, it was easily recognized and challenged in future transactions. The fiasco at the Canton Mint, combined with a scarcity of genuine Corollas dollars, gave rise to many imitators who were encouraged and sponsored by local Chinese officials. Since no minting facility existed at the time, Chinese consigned their production to registered silversmiths, with the only specifications being that the coins have no more than 10% of alloy. But here's the problem. There were many artisans working independently, each trying to make a profit on their endeavor. That resulted in a wide variety of debased imitation Corollas dollars, all dated 1788, flooding the avenues of commerce, resulting in much confusion and financial loss. The activities of licensed silversmiths were suspended. However, that did not stop forgeries by private individuals from continuing. The Chinese government was unable to do anything to remove and destroy the debased and counterfeit coinage. Therefore, it was up to Schroffs and merchants themselves to establish a method of self-protection. Each firm was mandated to guarantee that the dollar coins they paid out were genuine. Writes Willem, this was done by means of a stamp punch upon the surface of the coin with a steel die. The design was a small symbol particular to the issuing firm. The stamped insignia became known as chops, and coins so treated are known as chopped or chop marked pieces. The practice originated in the south of China sometime in the later half of the 18th century. However, according to Chinese researcher Gong Yai Bing, the chopping of silver coins began much earlier. Gong is the author of the circulation of foreign silver coins in southern coastal provinces of China, 1790 to 1890. <clears throat> a master's thesis awarded at the Chinese University of Hong Kong in 2006. He writes, the circulation of foreign silver coins in Guangdong, Canton, went with an impressive phenomenon, dollar chopping. When foreign silver coins came into China four centuries ago, during the 1500s, the Chinese believed they were a kind of silver ingot and evaluated them by weight and silver content, not by face value. They weighed every single silver ingot and silver coins, a quasi sisi weighed them with scales and assayed their purity by their experience and eyesight, chops and even chisels. Chopping was a part of Chinese daily life in dealing with all metallic currencies. Of the practice of chopping coins, Robert Chalmers reports that it appeared to be particular to the area of Canton and unknown in the north of China. He writes, in History of Currency in the British Colonies, London, 1893, native Chinese merchants stamp or sign chop every coin as it comes into their possession. No Chinese man will take back a dollar on which his stamp cannot be pointed out, though by the multitude of successive stamps, a chopped dollar not only loses its ring, but gradually becomes so obliterated that any individual stamp cannot be distinguished in one case out of a hundred. The state of a dollar long in circulation in Hong Kong is deplorable, but it seems impossible to overcome the Chinese Cantonese practice. 
So where did the Spanish dollars and other silver coins go in China? According to Gong Yai Bing, virtually all international silver coins arrived and remained in four Chinese provinces. Guangdong, over here. Fujian, which at the time included Taiwan. Zhejiang and Jiangsu, which included Shanghai until 1927. However, one source reports that Corolla's dollars were used in central China for the silk trade. Until 1842, Canton had been the singular official port for China's maritime trade. The monopoly of Hong merchants upon the Chinese foreign trade in effect made Canton become the sluice gate for the tremendous influx of foreign silver coins, which were mainly brought by foreign merchants with the purpose of procuring Chinese goods. In consequence, Guangdong naturally became the region where foreign coins circulated most broadly. In 1833, Lu Kun, general governor of Guangdong and Guangxi, described that, quote, Eastern Guangdong is the place where barbarians conduct trade. Hence, silver coins were used more widely. Merchants and retail traders both use foreign silver coins as the means of payment. The Patagon dollar, the Dutch silver rider Ducaton, mostly circulated in Canton before the massive imports of the Corollas dollars. It was called horse money or horse sword by the Cantonese. It was struck from 1659 to 1802. It also circulated widely in Taiwan. As silver coins arrived in Guangdong in huge quantities to trade, it became impossible for Cantonese people to visit the shroff for each transaction. A comparably stable exchange rate between silver coin and silver sisi ingot was created. Most silver payments in Guangdong were tendered in silver coins, not ingots. An artificial ratio was developed to have a stable link between the dollar system and the traditional silver tail system. This enabled Cantonese people to pay using coins by the count instead of the weight for daily commercial transactions. Writes Gong Yai Bing, foreign silver coins had spread to the entire territory of Guangdong province as early as the beginning of the 19th century. The dollar indeed circulated as the primary means of payment in comparison to the traditional silver ingot. This argument could also be bolstered archeologically. In fact, much fewer silver ingots, Saisi, of Guangdong can be found today in comparison to those of any other province in China. Cantonese shroffs and merchants have been plagued with counterfeit mill dollar coins from the start. Not just during the war between Spain and England of 1779 to 1783, no matter how good the counterfeiters became at their crooked craft, the constant was the inferior silver purity of such coins. Writes Gong Yai Bing, merchants coached their pupils and employees to always authenticate foreign silver coins in the most rigid way. Since even the coin bearing chop marks could be a fake, they had to rely on their own eyes and chops. And as a result, the silver coins were repeatedly and heavily chopped. Many fake detecting skills were exchanged among the merchants. And these were passed from one generation to another. Publications on authenticating foreign coins became must reads for the Cantonese merchant, especially for the money dealers. The Cantonese had four categories of silver coins that circulated in the province. One is well-conditioned coins, foreign silver coins without chop marks that were preferred by merchants of Jiangsu and Zhejiang, but not favored by the Cantonese. Chop coins, coins which had been chopped repeatedly but maintained their recognizable surfaces. Broken coins, these coins would have been defaced and may have become flat disks with a cup shape. 
fragmented coins, coins which had become seriously damaged after too many times being chopped and could barely keep their form as a coin. A wider variety of foreign coins circulated in Guangdong than in other Chinese provinces. This resulted in the Cantonese caring more about chop marks. Therefore, Cantonese made themselves accustomed to employing foreign silver coins with varying degrees of damage. Canton was the largest port city of China, and therefore a majority of foreign silver coins arrived there. It was only replaced as the largest port city by Shanghai in 1853. Early United States coins in China, 1794 to 1836. Writes Gong Yai Bing, the native US silver dollar coins have been brought in Guangdong by the US merchants in 1794. The American dollar could by no means win its popularity in the local market because in comparison to other foreign silver coins, it had much lesser weight and much lower fineness. This flowing hair dollar was called by Cantonese people unkept hair. It was sometimes called eagle dollar or bat dollar owing to the eagle on the reverse. The flowing hair dollar 1794 to 1795 and the drape bust dollar 1795 to 1803 were also called three flowers, seven stars. Most of those weird Chinese names of silver dollars could only be found out in the specialized pamphlets which were published with the clear intention of helping money exchangers, shroffs, to distinguish the differences of those coins. In daily life, foreign silver coins were known as foreign cash, foreign silver, barbarian silver, or barbarian cake. Gong discusses the lower silver fineness of the American silver dollars versus the Spanish dollars. The new US dollar contained 371.25 grains of silver, as opposed to the Spanish dollars, which had 377.25. That was a big deal to Chinese merchants and troughs who calculated value of silver coins based solely on their intrinsic value. However, not all Spanish dollars contained 377.25 grains of silver. Those Corollas dollars that circulated in the United States had considerably less silver. Those employed for the China trade were full-bodied and heavier coins. How and why was that? Because merchants and bullion dealers knew where they could get the better coins that the Chinese demanded. Then how and why did the US dollar only have 371.25 grains of silver? When Alexander Hamilton wrote his report on the establishment of a mint, report on the establishment of a mint, in 1791, he made errors and miscalculations when he developed the new US dollar. I will not discuss those at this time. However, a forthcoming article in ANS magazine that I wrote will detail Hamilton's role in creating US coinage. After the Drake bust dollar arrived in China, they were described in the minutes of the British East India Company. After the Drake, sorry, the dollars brought by the Americans are a national coin agreeing precisely in weight with the Spanish dollar. But on that they have a few cash more of alloy. They are stamped with the head of General Washington with 15 stars and the motto of Liberty dated 1795 and have on the reverse an eagle surrounded with laurels and the motto United States of America. The author of this report appears to have confused the obviously female liberty head with that of George Washington. There must have been a significant number of American dollars arriving in China, otherwise the EIC would not have discussed them in the report. What happened to US dollars in China? As discussed earlier, any new silver coin was viewed with suspicion by the Chinese, especially one that was significantly lighter than the Spanish dollar. That was indeed true with the US flowing hair and drape bust dollars. The vast majority of those dollars arrived in China and ended up as Saisi ingots. That is why examples of such coins are so rare today. 
This table provides compelling circumstantial evidence of flowing hair and drape bust silver dollars being swallowed up in the China trade. It presents the original mintages of flowing hair and drape bust dollars and the approximate numbers of survivors today. The few existing chop mark pieces are also evidence of this, in addition to scholarship on the subject. This is what research tells us about the early US dollars. Despite the fact that the US silver dollar contained less silver than the omnipresent Corollas dollars, they traded at par in the West Indies. Thus, silver merchants engaged in a cycle of exchange arbitrage. In that manner, American silver dollars vanished from circulation. From the West Indies, the vast majority of those new flowing hair and drape bust dollars were shipped to China, where they were traded for tea and other goods. After trading the new American silver dollars for Spanish ones in the West Indies, merchants brought the Corollas dollars to the Philadelphia Mint to serve as bullion for more new American silver dollars. After those dollars were ready at the mint, they were brought to the West Indies to trade for the more valuable Spanish dollars, thereby perpetuating the cyclical exchange arbitrage. What is confounding about this exchange arbitrage is that British merchants in the West Indies would trade the more valuable Spanish dollars for the US dollars. When they brought those American dollars to China, as discussed previously, they would be chopped, discounted, and melted into Saisi ingots. <clears throat> The American silver dollar was a complete failure. The drain of silver dollars was so extensive that the Philadelphia Mint ceased their production after the 1803 issue. Significantly, this policy was initiated by the presidential administration in order to stop the exportation of coins. This new policy was followed by mint officials without the passage of a specific law authorizing them to stop minting silver dollars. The death knell of the silver dollar rang in 1806 when President Thomas Jefferson formally suspended their production. But did this desperate measure stem the flood of American silver vanishing from our shores? Writes James Lawrence Loughlin, although the coinage of the United States silver dollar was discontinued, a profit was still realized by importing Spanish dollars because two half dollars served the same purpose as a dollar piece did before, containing, as they did, as much pure silver as the dollar piece. And our silver continued to be coined and exported. According to an 1832 congressional report by Representative Campbell P. White, the exportation of half dollars carried on steadily after 1804 and was extensive from 1811 to 1821. This table shows early half dollars from 1794 to 1797 with their mintages and the number of original coins graded by PCGS and NGC. For two dates, 1796 and 1797, the estimated number of survivors is presented. This table presents compelling circumstantial evidence of the large number of early half dollars that were employed in the China trade, replacing the US silver dollar in the West Indies exchange arbitrage. Cap bust half dollars in the China trade. The exchange arbitrage continued in the West Indies with a cap bust half dollar letter edge series, 1807 to 1836. Chop mark cap bust half dollars are great rarities. Their use in the China trade is documented through those chopped examples and numismatic research. This table shows cap bust half dollars from 1807 to 1811 with their mintages and the number of original coins graded by PCGS and NGC. As with the previous table, this table presents compelling circumstantial evidence of the large number of cap bust half dollars that were employed in the China trade, replacing the flowing hair and drape bust half dollars in the West Indies exchange arbitrage before being shipped off to China. As and as with the dollar coins and earlier half dollars, the cap bust halves were chopped, discounted, and melted into Chinese Saisi bullion ingots. 
As we all know, the original mintage of an issue does not determine its rarity. The survival rate is what is important. What is important. Therefore, the number of graded pieces in relation to original mintages gives us convincing evidence of rarity. Dramatic drop in Chinese silver species imports. In 1808, a Napoleonic army invaded Spain and imprisoned King Charles IV and the Crown Prince Ferdinand VII. The Peninsular War, 1807 to 1814, resulted in upheavals in Spain's American colonies. The Spanish-American Wars of Independence, 1808 to 1833, brought about both territorial and monetary fragmentation in the Spanish Empire. Those wars were the cause of a collapse of mining and coin production in Spanish America. They caused a dramatic contraction of Chinese silver imports. Economic and monetary historian Alejandra Irigoyen writes, the root of the halt of silver specie imports and later the outflow of the metal lies in the quality of the standard silver coins in circulation in the international economy. Indeed, the problem was not the quantity of silver, but the quality of silver coin, end quote. Traditionally, the shortages of silver have been explained by excessive opium imports from British India and extensive outpourings of silver to pay for it. In contrast to the Corollas dollars, the coins issued by Mexico and other Latin American republics varied widely in quality over the years. The increasing variety of Republican coins with their different sizes, fineness and appearances, and with it the regular debasement, debasement of such resulted in the collapse of the silver standard of the most successful world coin of its day. The Chinese learned of changes in Latin American Republican coinage almost immediately. <clears throat> Beginning in the 1820s, the arrival of debased Republican coinage confounded shroffs and merchants, creating a problem that had never existed in the time of the Corollas dollars. In order to determine and establish a new silver standard, Republican coins were chopped and marked with every single transaction, hereby further damaging the physical integrity of them. Virtually all were discounted and eventually melted into Sisi. Very few chopped Republican coins exist today. The 1822 chicken dollar presented here is a great rarity. It is important to note that the vast majority of silver coins exported to China during this period were the Corollas dollar, the Latin American Republican dollars, and the Mexican eight reales, also called the Mexican dollar or eagle dollar. The US dollars and half dollars, while of great interest to, numis to numismatists, were merely a drop in the bucket compared to the massive amounts of Spanish and Latin American dollars shipped off to the celestial empire. This timeline is important to understand how the silver species exported to China by the United States changed over time. 1785 to circa 1820, Spanish Corollas dollars, US silver dollars and half dollars, flowing hair, drape bust, cap bust. From circa 1820 to 1857, Republican Latin American dollars, Mexican dollars, US silver and half dollars, seated liberty and cap bust. 1857 to 1873, Mexican dollars, US silver and half dollars, seated liberty. This timeline is not monolithic. For example, Corollas dollars very well may have been explored after 1820, for it was a standard coin of China until 1857, even though it had not been minted since 1808. Another example is that Seated Liberty dollars may have been exported after 1873, since they were not used in circulation. This is an important quote to understand the US role in the Chinese economy in the 19th century. Quote, the United States after 1785 progressed to become China's main provider of silver. The U.S. accounted for a full 97% of silver imports into China, 
between 1807 and 1833. 92.2 million pesos, or 2,225 tons of pure silver. And over the subsequent 30 or 40 years, they were the sole source of silver specie from the West, end quote. Alejandra Irigoyen, economic and monetary historian at the London School of Economics. The silver dollar coin returned as a circulating medium in 1840. It was struck from 1840 to 1873. But did it actually circulate in the United States? Economist Stuart Simon Newcomb wrote in 1879, it would probably be safe to assert that one half of the citizens of our country, born since 1840, had never seen a United States silver dollar. If we should be mistaken in this, if we should be shown that one half of our people had seen a silver dollar sometime in their lives, we could still fall back on the well-known historic fact that the dollar in question was rarely used as money after 1840." End quote. There were problems with the new silver dollar coin. Even though prominent members of the business community, as well as politicians, knew that the earlier flowing hair and drape plus dollars failed in China due to their light weight of 371.25 grains, the new seated Liberty dollar was producing the same inferior content. Plus the seated Liberty dollar was always intrinsically worth over a dollar, at times worth around one dollar and eight cents or more. And, and as Stuart Newcomb writes, the seated Liberty dollar, quote, was rarely used as money after 1840, end quote. Numerous scholars over the years tell us that the vast majority of seed liberty dollars were sent to China for trade. Again, I point to a table for numbers don't lie. Here are the first 10 years of the seed liberty dollar, their mintages and original examples graded by PCGS and NGC. If they did not circulate as money, then they must have gone somewhere. Both the Philadelphia Mint and the New Orleans Mint were located in commercial port cities that were leading international export centers. Chop mark examples, such as this 1849 seated Liberty dollar are compelling evidence of such coins being employed in the China trade. Such pieces are very rare as discussed previously. It is important to understand that China demanded only silver coins in trade, not bullion or silver bars. What is the evidence of this? China had no mints to produce silver coins until 1889. China relied on the West, especially the US, to provide them with silver coins. Chinese silver production did exist, but it was employed solely for creating sicey bullion ingots, which were used as tail money throughout China. Substandard coins, lightweight US and Republican Latin American, and damaged chopped Spanish and Mexican coins were melted to produce sicy. Any discussion of silver bars or bullion being shipped to China from the US is not supported by evidence. Evidence suggests that any and all silver bars and bullion shipped from the US to Asia ended up in Indian mints where it was used to produce silver rupees. See at Liberty half dollars in the China trade. Merchants in the China trade had to pay steep premiums to purchase Mexican Eagle dollars to send to China. That is why they sent both US dollars and US half dollars to China. Even though they were chopped and discounted below their bullion value, it was better to use them than have no coins to offer in trade. Since the China trade was so massive, exporters grabbed every silver dollar and half dollar that they could to ship off to the Celestial Empire. F.M. Rose, who authored the first of only two books on chop mark coins in the China trade, writes, quote, chop mark seated liberty halves are collectible by date and mint mark, end quote. Considering the great 1878 S rarity, as well as other rarities, that statement is probably not completely correct. In essence, it appears that he was saying that there are many chopped seated Liberty half dollars out there to be had. Additionally, Rose reports that there are between 101 and 500 surviving seated Liberty half dollars 
that carry chop marks available to collectors. However, since Rose published his book in 1987, well before the days of the internet, one could argue that there are many more available today, perhaps even approaching 800 to 1,000 pieces. Evidence of San Francisco mint seated Liberty halves in the China trade is provided by Paul M. Green in Numismatic News. He writes, quote, as the largest silver denomination in regular production in San Francisco, half dollars were exported. We have proof as they were found in China and sometimes they had chop marks, end quote. Green cites a 1996 superior auction sale in Hong Kong writing that, quote, the indication is very clear that San Francisco half dollars from 1860 through the early 1870s regularly sailed west to China, end quote. Green continues, quote, this collection featured a wide range of half dollars dates purchased in Hong Kong and a number were chop marked, which is clear proof they were in China. San Francisco dates from the 1860s were especially numerous including 19 examples of the 1861S, 20 of the 1862S, and 15 of the 1863S. The clear suggestion is that long before the trade dollar, Sea Liberty half dollars were being sent to China, and that sort of export may help to explain why the half dollar mintages during the period remained higher than other silver denominations." End quote. I present a table as evidence of San Francisco mint half dollars being used in the China trade. These are the last seven issues of the Sea of Liberty half dollar up to 1873 from the San Francisco mint. As discussed earlier, comparing the number of graded examples against the original mintages gives us a good sense of rarity. Plus dollar coins were rarely struck at the San Francisco mint. In 1859, there were 20,000 Sea of Liberty dollars struck, but only a small amount of them ended up in China. In 1872, there were just $9,000 produced in San Francisco. In all likelihood, most were sent to China. No other estimate Sea of dollars were struck. Since so few Sea of Liberty dollars were produced at the San Francisco Mint, it made sense for merchants to acquire the vast majority of Sea of Liberty half dollars from the Western Mint. Now I present strong circumstantial evidence of San Francisco mint half dollars being used in huge volumes in the China trade. San Francisco Harbor. How much of a no brainer would it have been for silver merchants and brokers to go to the San Francisco mint, buy up as many half dollars as possible, and then bring them in horse drawn wagons to ship a few miles from the mint. It was actually only 3.4 miles from the old mint to the harbor. Other circumstantial evidence is found in the steep premium silver merchants had to pay for Mexican dollars for the China trade, at times topping off at 22%. But wait, there is even more circumstantial evidence pointing to San Francisco Mint half dollars being sent to China. Let's look at the previous panel again, please. Please take another look at the mintages and graded pieces from 1867 to 1873. Starting in 1867, the Mexican government added a 12% excise tax on every silver coin exported from Mexico. Because of that, merchants literally stopped buying Mexican dollars. If they had no Mexican dollars, then what could they possibly send to China? I would like to add another element of this argument to the mix. I feel compelled to do so but there are numismatists who deny that US coins were used in the China trade, as well as numismatists who completely ignore the China trade when discussing a coin's rarity. Let's compare the 1870 CC Seated Liberty half dollar with the 1870S half dollar. Ron Guth writes in PCGS Coin Facts, quote, 1870 was the first year in which the Carson City Mint went into production of U.S. coins. In its first year, mintages of every denomination were very low, creating instant rarities across the board. For anyone collecting this series, 
1870 CC half dollar is one of the toughest of all the dates. Now let's examine what Guth wrote about the 1870 S half dollar. Quote, in 1870, employees at the San Francisco Mint produced over 1 million half dollars. This was larger than the half dollars produced at the Philadelphia and Carson City Mints combined. Nonetheless, because of the great distance between the San Francisco Mint and collectors back east, very few half dollars ended up in collections. Now let's compare the mintages of those two coins with the graded original examples by PCGS and NGC. Interestingly, there are 20 more of the Carson City Instant Rarity coins graded by PCGS and NGC than the over 1 million San Francisco minted coins. So where could the 1870s half dollars possibly have gone? Things were about to change dramatically in the US approach to international trade and the coins used to pay for foreign goods. There would be dramatic changes to our coinage vis-a-vis -vis the China trade. The most important factor was the exploitation of the Comstock load outside of Virginia City, Virginia, Nevada. It was discovered in 1859, and by the early 1870s, there were enormous amounts of silver available to be used to produce huge volumes of coins. The days of American merchants importing Mexican coins for the China trade had ended in 1867, and now the U.S. was on the verge of finally creating its own trade dollar. I will not discuss the trade dollar in this presentation. However, those ANS members who are interested in learning about the trade dollar are invited to read my article in ANS Magazine 2023, Issue 2, which was published in May. I have written a related article for the numismatist, Blood Money, that discusses coins in the China trade, including the U.S. trade dollar. The focus of this article is on the U.S. role in the 19th century opium trade. If any ANS members would be interested in reading this article, uh, please let me know and I will send you a PDF of it. I will put my email address in the chat so you may contact me. But Peter said he would make it available in the, in, as a link. So Peter will discuss that. I would like to thank all the ANS members who attended this presentation. At this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Wonderful, thank you, Eric. Um, we are just now setting up a link in the chat to the Blood Money uh, article, so you should be able to uh, find it there momentarily. Um, and in the meantime, um, happy to um, direct any questions to you, Eric. Uh, yes. Just, uh, just uh, Can I Put that Can I ask a question, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, thank you. First, thanks very much for a really comprehensive talk. There was really some good information in there. Um, my you. question is maybe a semantics one. Uh, you always use the term um, carolus dollars, and uh, I'm sort of more familiar with the, the thought of uh, bus dollars, which include the Charles III, the Charles IV, and the Ferdinand VII. Is there some distinction between the Ferdinand VII and the Charles III and the Charles IV? Uh, the Charles III and the Charles IV are considered, in my research, Corollas dollars and also Spanish dollars. Uh, some do call them bus dollars, but I would, if I use that term, that may be confused with the drape bus dollars of the Americans when I discuss uh, okay. the coins together. Yes, they are also called bus dollars, but the Ferdinand VII, um, is considered a Spanish dollar, but I believe it was struck by loyalists um, in well, the Spanish America because it was not the the the, the coins that we that I researched. They ended. It went from 1772 to seven to 1808. Right. The Ferdinand, I believe, was 1808 to 1814. I believe. No, they went. They went straight to 1821. I'm Mexico sorry. City was striking. I'm, I'm, not, as fam I'm not as familiar with them as the others, I, I must ex admit, but they were considered Spanish dollars, but they yeah. also were not as valued as the Corollas, the Charles III, the Charles IV in China itself. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Uh, Michael Werner, you have your hand up. 
Uh, yeah, I was. I'm. I'm very curious about the San Francisco Mint um, statistics. Um, in 1873, the second uh, uh, San Francisco Mint, the Granite Lady, was was open for business. Um, what happened at that point? I mean, both both that mint and the Commonwealth Street Mint were about a mile from the main piers at on Market Street, where I imagine these things went from. Um, was there, you know, was it was the the China trade continuing when? Yes, when because the Granite Lady opened, um, and their production numbers increased. The, the production that's when the 1873 was when the trade dollar was initiated. So that was that was a huge mintage of trade dollars. So that replaced the half dollars and the silver dollars in the China trade, and it replaced the Mexican dollars. There were millions of trade dollars produced. I invite you to read my article on in the ANS magazine because that'll give you a, a full background on the trade dollar. Thanks. I, I will. I enjoyed your article in the uh, in the numismatist, by the way. Oh, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. Good. Do we have any other? Questions. Oh, we, we, there's one in the uh, chat from John uh, Tatman, which I'm happy to either read or John, if you'd like to ask it live, it's up to you. Uh, yeah. Sure, Peter, I can ask it live. Um, sure. I, I have a uh, later date to Carson City Quarter that has uh, chop marks on it, but I was wondering if uh, uh, during the, the time period before 1873, if it was common for uh, smaller denominations like quarters or dimes to end up in China. Okay, um, yes, it was not common, but they were rare. That's a great, that's a great rarity because quarters and there was, I even saw a photograph of a, of a bust uh, quarter. I believe it was, I'm sorry, not a quarter, but I've seen chopped quarters, images of chopped quarters. They were not sent they would probably be sent, just tossed into the batch. They were not pulled by the millions or the thousands. They were just, they're rare. They're very rare. So you have a, a nice rarity there. But I, I did not, most of the chop coins that I found in my research are the dollars, American dollars and the American half dollars up to 17, 1873. Great, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I had a question um, for you, and contrary to my name tag there, this is Doug Ward, not my wife, Suzanne. <laughs> but uh, yeah, a question, um, was gold used at all in the China trade? And if not, why not? Okay. Um, I've researched this, and there's, there was some gold used to pay for opium, but it was next to nothing. It was the Chinese loved silver. They had been getting silver since the 1500s from Spain and Spanish America. They didn't want gold. They literally did not want gold. Um, I've written, I've read research. I read a master's thesis by a Chinese researcher. It's a 129 page master's thesis published in 2006. He did not mention gold once. I've written, I've read scholarship by um, monetary, and economic scholars who folk who specialize in silver exports and exports of coins to China. They literally don't even mention gold coins. They mention, and the when they mention silver bars, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, I saw the only evidence I saw of silver bars going to Asia was to India. And that was by Alejandra Irigoyen, who was the uh, economic and monetary historian that I quoted in the in the presentation. So this was just cultural then or? I think so, because if you look at India, India, they preferred silver, but they also liked gold. Um, however, for some reason, China just didn't want anything to do with it. That's there all I a, can figure out. There was a similar dynamic in um, when gold was discovered in California, converted into the octagonal slugs and then exported hugely um, out of California. But uh, I guess most of that went to Europe then. We've always been sending, we started sending gold to Europe in the 1820s, I believe, because our gold was undervalued. And gold typically went to Europe. I 
in a future article, I have a wonderful anecdote where a, a congressman talks about finding out that the 1795 uh, eagle, eagle coins were ending up in shops in England. And he said something to the effect of, thus do our eagles fly away. But typically our goal goes, our goal had gone to Europe historically. Listen, Interesting. Uh, Gilles, you've, you've got your hand up. Yes, um, I don't know, maybe it's slightly outside of a scope of uh, the, um, the, the, that topic, but since you're saying there's a preference for silver in China, we do see gold, uh, I mean, this kind of flat gold ingots from Japan at the same period. So are, are you aware of a difference or a cultural difference between Japan and China? <clears throat> well, Japan at one point supplied China with a lot of silver, but then their silver was exhausted and they stopped. Because before the Spanish, or around the time of the Spanish, the Japanese were also providing silver to China, but they stopped. The, the culture, I don't know much about Japanese monetary or economic culture, but it's very different than China. It was a much smaller land. They were probably more open to the gold because they were an island nation and they had more exposure to all different cultures. China was, even though it was very large, it was quite insular. And when they grasped onto something, they basically stuck with it. They didn't, for example, China didn't end, China was on the silver standard until 1935 along with Hong Kong. The only reason they got off it was because of the, uh, I forgot the name of the act. There was a Silver Purchase Act, which screwed up the Chinese economy because they were losing all their silver because the West was paying higher rates. So they were losing their silver, which was a backing for their economy. But they were literally on the silver standard until 1935. Um, any other questions? Jesse, did I, I see him up there? Yes, yes, yes. Hi, brother, er, Eric. Uh, good to see you. Uh, Hi, Jesse. How are you? Doing well. I'll be seeing you at the Summer Fun Show in a yes. few months. But, uh, my, I've been in and out, so I apologize if this was covered. But I, I there's a theory brewing that uh, as Chinese uh, immigrants came to the United States, uh, this practice was also being done in San Francisco and in California. Uh, can you speak to that at all? <sighs> I say it's a rumor. I don't know why they would do it. It, it I mean, we could discuss that at the fun show, but it, to me, it just seems like a fallacy, like it's just a fantasy. I mean, is there any evidence? Is there any written evidence? I mean, there's no purpose. To me, there's no purpose in chopping it in San Francisco. I mean, it was, it was, that was the, that was the cultural practice in China. San Francisco, the Chinese people were sending trade dollars and to to China, I don't think they would want to chop it. They they didn't have the resources to do more work than they were poor people. Uh, that's that's my feeling. Uh, um, there's a uh, question in the in the chat from David Hershey saying, uh, "Any books you recommend on this topic?" Um, books, okay. Um, there's some scholarship I can recommend. Um, here's the interesting thing. When I started doing my research, I found there were two books on chop mark coins. One was published in 1987 by F.M. Rose, R-O-S-E. And there was a book in 2014 uh, published by Colin Goldberg on chop mark coins in the China trade. And then when I started researching articles, I used those sources. But then literally there's there was, I, there was nothing more. I'm, I'm literally inventing the wheel with this because I'm finding the research from the monetary and economic historians. I mean, if you look up the, if you look on the presentation when it's on YouTube and you see the quote from Alejandra Irigoyen, she wrote three substantial papers on this topic. And that's, that's the, I consider her the best source on that. I, she has not written any books as far as I know, but her research is gripping. And it's, this, it's the basis of my work. 
And I recommend that. I also recommend an author named Richard von Glan uh, of UCLA, um, V-O-N, uh, capital G-L-A-H-N. But he mostly writes about China be up to 1700, but he does go into the 19th century sometimes. But those are the two scholars I would recommend you look at because they are, they're the finest, they're the best in this field. Very good. Um, Michael Warner had another question in the chat saying, you mentioned the silver going to India to make rupees. Did any of those go to China? I presume you mean uh, rupees going to China. Is that correct, Michael? Okay. Um, if you get the article Blood Money, which Peter made available, you'll see that there was a triangular opium trade between China, India, and England. However, China had to pay India in silver coins. That's all the British and the Indians would accept. The Indians used the silver to make rupees, and the British used the silver to have money. Virtually, as I quoted uh, Irigoyen, almost all the silver coins for the entire 19th century going to China were coming from the United States. They were a combination of Mexican, Latin American, and the American silver dollars and half dollars. All of that, whether in coin form or sicey form, not all of it, but a lot of it was going to India to pay for opium. So there was not silver going from India to China. It was only going from China to India to pay for opium, which the British forced upon the Chinese in two opium wars and in their goal to become a greater wealthy country. Hmm. That's what I figured. Um, you know that, that 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 was the only the only trade. I just wondered if there was anything else going between the two countries, but it sounds like there was. Um, it really was a one way. It was one way, even though India was a British colony. There were there were Indians who did benefit from the the, the China trade because the the elite in India, the the merchant class, the the people who transported the opium, the people who cultivated the opium in India. They were making money, you know, a lot, of, most of the Indians were poor, they were poverty stricken, you know, most people in the opium trade were poor farmers or poor workers, but it, the money, the silver was going from India, from China to India, it was not going the other way, because India had literally no, and still has no silver production, so India needed the silver from the Chinese, and from wherever they could get it, to make their rupees. China had production of silver, but they were using it to make Saisi because most of the country used Saisi, not the silver international coins. The Saisi was made with domestic silver and a combination of those coins that were being chopped and damaged and melted down. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Well, we are, uh, we're at the top of the hour. Um, if there are no other questions, um, seem to be. I'd like to thank you again, Eric, for a wonderful presentation. And also, uh, I'd like to remind everybody to take a look at Eric's article in the um, next issue or the issue of the AMS magazine, which should be on your doorsteps already or should be arriving soon. Um, also, would like to take this opportunity to again thank Bill Bird for his wonderful donation of Chopmark coins which is very timely considering all the work that uh, Eric has been doing on this lately and publishing on this lately. So, um, you know, as uh, we work through all this, we will be um, cataloging it and putting it online in Mantis. So you will soon be able to see it there, hopefully uh, by the end of the summer. So um, thank you again. Hope you all have a, a wonderful afternoon and Eric, um, well done. Thank you. I really enjoyed doing this presentation for you in the ANS. Yep. All right. Well, take care. Have a good weekend, everyone. You too. Bye.